Hello. All right, uh, before we start, I just wanted to thank the translator who's doing an excellent job today. Um, yeah. I think it's kind of cool that if I stand up here and say that I'm awesome, that he has to say that he's awesome, so that's kind of cool. <laughs> All right, so my talk is called Dropping Rails for Drop Wizard, and we're going to talk about what that means here in a second. So this is me. Uh, my name is Brian. Uh, I'm on the Rails team at Yammer uh, in San Francisco, and we'll talk about in a minute what Yammer does. Uh, but briefly, the Rails team is responsible for kind of keeping the monolith happy, figuring out ways to make it better and smaller, um, and less responsible for most of Yammer.com. Um, and again, you can see that I like Zelda and Ruby and music. All right, so let's talk about what Yammer is real quick. Um, it'll help give us some context and give us some hints about some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. And like we've heard earlier today, uh, Everything we're doing is about generating customer value uh, and building products. Uh, so I'm going to take a minute to talk about what our product is. Um, so kind of the one-liner is a freemium enterprise social network. So what that means is that we have these isolated social networks uh, for companies, whoever wants to sign up, uh, based on your email address. Um, so it's free to join. We have paid upgrade features. Um, and kind of the, the key feature is these public by default conversations through groups that you can create. Um, then we try and promote discovery of content and groups uh, through various feeds. Um, we were acquired by Microsoft in 2012. Uh, most of our architecture has stayed the same, uh, which has been really cool. Um, and we're becoming part of the Office 365 suite. Um, and so we've kind of evolved into a service-oriented architecture. We didn't start out that way. Um, we did have, a in the beginning, this big Rails app. Uh, still today, we have a pretty big Rails app. Uh, but kind of the goal is to make it smaller, like you guys just saw in the last talk. And so this is a pretty rough overview of what Yammer's architecture looks like. Um, all the blue there is Java. Um, the uh, purple stuff there is Ruby. And uh, the orange is a Node.js service that we won't talk about. Um, and so our main Rails tier, just to give you an idea of perspective uh, of scale, uh, our main Rails tier has 110 nodes. Uh, we've got about 14 workers. And our Rails app does roughly 135,000 requests per minute. Um, we heavily cache everything through memcache. And uh, so at peak, we do half a million memcache gets per second. Uh, and only about 2,500 database calls per second. So most things are coming out of cache. Um, and so half a million messages are posted a day. Um, kind of an idea of where we're at. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to talk more about this with anyone afterwards, if you come and find me. Um, I'm a little shy, but I like talking about this stuff. And I'd like to hear like, the solutions you guys have to this, too. So come find me throughout the conference, and let's chat. So we have a spoiler alert coming up here. Um, so when I was planning for the talk, I knew what I wanted to talk about, but I didn't have, oh, what happened? <laughs> I should probably turn off Wi-Fi somehow. Well, I think it's going to come back, but we'll see. OK. Um, so like I said, playing with the talk, I knew what I wanted to talk about, didn't really have um, a title. So I was talking to a friend, and he said, why don't you do something provocative, like dropping rails for Drop Wizard? Um, and so it carries some weight, especially at a Ruby conference. Uh, you might not know what Drop Wizard is, but like you're curious why Yammer would want to drop it for uh, or move to Drop Wizard from Rails. Um, so it was a little too provocative, so I added the question mark on the end, so it kind of um, leaves it open. Uh, but I, I don't want to mislead you guys at all. So um, there's the spoiler: we didn't drop rails, um, and so we're going to kind of talk about. Uh, what that means. So great. Uh, why are we here then? If, if we already know the title, the answer to the title of the talk. Uh, so the truth of the matter is, uh, not too long ago at Yammer, most of all of our services were written in Java and Drop Wizard. Um, and if you remember back a couple slides, I mentioned that we evolved into a service-oriented architecture. Uh, so when we started, we looked uh, quite a bit different, uh, but we were on a pretty clear path for all services at Yammer to be written in, in Drop Wizard. And so here's again, this is what we look like today. But if we take it back a couple years, it was much different. Um, simple Rails app, talking to Postgres, 
Uh, but we outgrew this pretty quickly. Uh, ended up somewhere where most Rails apps probably start these days. We've got some caching. We've got some workers. Um, but still, it was really. All right, I'm going to fix this real quick. Turn off Wi-Fi. Uh, OK. Sweet, continuing on, I hope. It's not going to pop up again, I promise. <laughs> uh, so like I said, we grew in a place that probably uh, most apps start at. Uh, but our Rails app was still really big. It still had a ton of data in the Postgres database. Um, and so we knew we had some issues, some customer issues coming up where we were growing, we needed to scale. Um, and so we started to add some services. And the first ones we added were some Java services. Uh, we had some really big concerns about performance on some things. Um, so this is kind of the route we took. We, we have here a feed service that manages uh, delivery of feeds, things like that. And we also had one there called RD, which is our real-time service that we'll talk about. Uh, but we knew it needed to handle like thousands and hundreds of thousands of simultaneous connections. Um, so kind of Java is the way we gravitated for that. And so as the engineering team grew, uh, this helped us to move pretty quickly still. Um, so we continued down that path. We kept adding more Java services. Um, but we kept adding to the monolith as well. And it was still extremely large. It was a choke point for a lot of things. Uh, like we heard in the last talk, like uh, test suite was really slow. Um, and so we still needed a, a, another solution here. Um, so that was about six months ago. Today, we've added a lot more Rails services. Um, so we moved to present day here, uh, and we see all that purple at the bottom. Um, so we're still seeing that there's a place for Ruby and Rails uh, apps and services at Yammer to help us keep shipping f features and moving fast. Um, so that's enough of our architecture. Um, so let's talk about what, what this means and what we're going to learn today and what I hope you guys get out of this talk. So we're going to start off by looking at how DropWizard, another framework, uh, just solves problems. Uh, so this is just a pretty good exercise. Look outside of our community a little bit. Um, we'll learn something new, maybe give you guys something to play with, um, and just learn something new and cool. Um, but if you don't like that, or you don't want something new to play with, or Java, Java horrifies or offends you, um, we're going to talk about how Yammer applies some of these things back to our Rails apps as well, and how you can do some of those same things. And then we'll wrap it up. Uh, by talking about how Yammer decides what stacks we're going to build on. Do we build in Java? Do we build in Ruby? If we choose Ruby, like we have tons of options there, too. So um, there's that use the right tool for the job. Um, there's a little more to it than that. So we're going to talk about that. So we'll come back to all these things. Uh, so we're going to start off with this, looking at how another framework solves problems. And so what is DropWizard? Let's, let's talk about what that is. Um, it was created at Yammer in 2010, uh, driven a lot by this guy named Kota Hale, um, who was an engineer at Yammer at the time. Uh, so we built a couple services in Java, and then we saw that a lot of the ways we built them were the same. And so we took all of those libraries that we used, kind of cobbled them together, and made it super easy to keep repeating that pattern. Um, and then we open sourced this thing. So this is totally open source, all the stuff that I'm talking about. Um, if you can see it, this is the comic where the name Drop Wizard comes from. You can see at the top that there's a drop hazard, and the guy's looking at it, he goes to the next sign, there's a sign for a drop wizard, and he doesn't know what that is, and all of a sudden there's a wizard pushing him off a cliff. <laughs> okay, so yeah, Drop, uh, it's a Java framework for developing ops-friendly, high-performance RESTful web services. So we're going to see a lot of similarities in the way we build this thing, similar to something like Sinatra or Grape, um, more so than Rails, but still similarities on both sides. Basically, collections of endpoints that are optimized for serializing to something like JSON um, and returning those responses. Um, pretty lightweight, gives you a bunch of tools to use, uh, and you get to put them together. Um, but it also makes some uh, important decisions for us as well. 
Uh, it follows one of the key principles that we're familiar with today with Rails, which is convention over configuration. Um, so it makes decisions for us so we can kind of get rid of the boilerplate um, and just start building the apps that we need to build so we can start delivering value to customers. Um, so it provides support for a number of things, resources, metrics, configuration, logging, all of those typical components. Um, lots that we're familiar with with Rails, but some new ones as well. And so one of the key differences that I want to talk about is this claim here, production ready out of the box. Um, and this stands mostly true for Yammer. When we build a new Drop Wizard service, it's pretty much ready to go to production uh, for a number of reasons. And so there's kind of this set of conventions around Drop Wizard that make them ready and easy to deploy. Um, conventions that have been chosen for us so we don't have to implement these things uh, and just kind of don't have to worry about it. And so this is a screenshot of Drop Wizard coming up. If you were to start up a simple Drop Wizard app, you would see this. Um, and there's a huge warning at the bottom that I'm going to read. It says, this application has no health checks. This means you will never know if it dies in production, which means you will never know if you're letting your users down. You should add a health check for each of your application's dependencies, which fully but lightly tests it. Um, so that's pretty scary. Um, there's this convention telling us to do this thing uh, that's going to help make our app better for production. Um, and so what this basically is is, uh, a way to check on our app's health uh, so the app can respond if, it can, if it's able to uh, serve a request. But something more than that too, make sure it can talk to the database, uh, some other things. And so we use this on our load balancers to know like, if we can send traffic to a node, uh, but also with pager duty to know like, if there's something wrong with this thing, if we need to alert about it. Uh, the next key thing that makes Drop Wizard production ready is that metrics are being collected out of the box and being serviced automatically for us. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff you get for free, and it's pretty trivial to add new timing to things. Uh, we've got some similarities in Rails that we'll talk about, uh, but the emphasis is pretty different. Um, so in Rails, you have to do a bit of plumbing to get to the data that you care about. Um, and here, it's just exposed on 8081 on this port, uh, slash metrics, for us to kind of consume and peruse and, and look at. Uh, it's a convention in Drop Wizard. Uh, so here also, it's a little small, but there's a bunch of numbers. Um, if you look closely, this is the number of uh, requests and some timing for a given endpoint. It's about 9,000 requests, and there are some really small fractions of one there. So 99.9% uh, .9 of requests uh, to this endpoint got served in under four milliseconds, and 99% of requests got served in under half a millisecond. So super high performance. Um, and that's pretty impressive, but the important part, the, the part that I want to drive home is that like, all of this comes out of the box ready to go for us. And so for, if we're looking at how this is laid up out in Drop Wizard versus Rails, um, there's some, kind of some analogs in the Rails world. Um, Drop Wizard lacks some of the generation and directory structure stuff that we get with Rails, uh, but Java provides a little bit there for us, uh, and we've got some ways to work around some of that as well. Uh, so just real briefly, like you have a configuration class in Drop Wizard, which kind of mirrors uh, rails.application.config, kind of similar there. Uh, application class, kind of the same thing in Rails. Uh, we have these representation classes in Drop Wizard, which are kind of like if you're, if you're using Rails out of the box, if you use with JBuilder, or if you're like bringing in active model serializers, kind of that deal. Um, we have resource classes, which are pretty much controllers with routes sprinkled on top of them, similar to my, what you might see in like Sinatra or Grape. Um, and then these health check classes in Drop Wizard, which really don't have a, a great match in the Rails world unless you're bringing in via an add-on of some sort. All right, oi mundo, let's uh, look at some code. Uh, it is some Java code, uh, but it's a little scary, uh, so we'll do our best. Um, we'll look at some short snippets, um, and I'll post some links afterwards so you guys can check out the full examples. So one of the things we need right out of the box is this uh, server.yaml configuration file, and it sets up a bunch of stuff for us, all here kind of in the same place for our Drop Wizard app. So we set up the server, um, we've got we're setting up logging, uh, and then at the bottom, we're setting up the database, if, if that's a thing. Uh, but we can also add arbitrary bits in here that we want that we can wire up with our configuration class and kind of keep all of the configuration here together so that when we ship this uh, service, the uh, YAML config file is the only thing we change between environments. Uh, so this is a resource. This is our Hello World resource. Um, and we talked about how essentially this is a controller with uh, routing embedded in there. 
And so if you're not familiar with Java, the stuff at the top is kind of setting up the namespace um, of this class uh, and then requiring some dependencies. Uh, and then starting there from the path annotation, we can see the routing t start to take form. Um, but immediately following that, we've got the class definition, uh, which is really cool because it's just a plain Java class. It's not inheriting from anything. And we see that uh, we have some more routing stuff to tell, this, tell us that this is a Git resource. We've got uh, some cache control there to tell us cache this for a day. Uh, and then we see the action just show up there. Uh, typically, this would return a uh, representation object with, that would probably serialize to JSON. But to keep this simple, we just have a string that gets returned, uh, just plain text. And so like I said, this is really cool because it's just a plain Java object. And so unit testing this is really simple. We just instantiate one of these things, um, and then we can just call the methods. And so if we were to go run this thing, we would quickly compile it, uh, start it up, and then we would get some output that shows us uh, the, the uh, routes that are being surfaced through this service, um, as well as what it's running on. And so we make our first request. Uh, and if we just curl our hello world endpoint uh, with the name Mundo, we can see at the bottom, hello Mundo. Uh, really basic. We see our cache control header. We see our content type and our 200 OK. Um, really basic, but we're running. And so if we keep going and we get a little more complicated, we heed the warning about the uh, health check. Um, we implement, here is our random health check. Again, at the top, we have uh, the namespace and dependencies, um, and then straight into our health check class, which in this case does inherit from a health check. Um, and we see that we don't have a, a convenient logger like we would in Rails. So we have to instantiate our own, pretty basic. Uh, and then we get right into the health check. So we can see if we return an unhealthy result that it's going to fail, or if we raise an exception. Uh, or if we return healthy, we know that this is good. Um, and so this is a really simple example that generates a random number. And if it's not one, it's unhealthy. Because why would you serve traffic if this random number wasn't one? And so we can see we hit the endpoint, uh, slash health check. And we can see this cool little payload that says there was an error, and it tells us exactly what, what went wrong. Uh, we can see more things here about the database if that's what was blowing up as well. Um, and we hit it again. This time it's successful. Uh, so we get a 200. We see that everything's good. Um, so that's pretty cool. So that's really the basics of, of Drop Wizard. Uh, there's a little more code that you need to wire this together. Um, but, but these are the relevant parts to get us started talking about the rest of this stuff. Um, so if you go to dropwizard.io, there's a tutorial there for building a Hello World app uh, that has some pretty similar pieces to this, but gets a little deeper into it. Um, but since we're at a Ruby conference, uh, let's stop talking about Java now. After I get some water. So if we go back to this diagram again, uh, the one about our architecture about six months ago, uh, we see lots of Drop Wizard services uh, and a really compelling reason to write them because they're really easy, they're really performant, um, they're really easy to manage in production. Uh, but we still had a pretty big monolith, and uh, things were still being added to it at a pretty alarming rate. So we started thinking about ways to break this apart even further. Um, even though we already had all these high-performance Java services, uh, we felt like we wanted to pull apart the Rails app more. And we felt like we wanted to do this in Ruby and with Rails. Um, but at the time, it was kind of hard to put that into words, like why we would do it that way. Um, and it was kind of controversial with the team that was working on these Java services as well. They're like, we built this thing, and it works really well. Why don't you guys want to use it? Um, so we kept pushing on. And uh, at the very least, the first thing we had to do was make sure that our, our Ruby apps would work as well in production as these Java services would, make sure they were easy to roll out. Um, so we started going down that path. And so that brings us to our next part, applying the good parts uh, from Drop Wizard back to our Rails apps. Um, so we looked outside the community into Drop Wizard um, to start applying some of these things back to our apps. Um, lots of these concepts that I'm going to show already appear of some sort in the Ruby or the Rails world. Uh, but a lot of these things are done different ways. And we don't necessarily have strong conventions or support out of the box for these things. Uh, so they're definitely worth talking about. Um, and if you're doing these things already, that's awesome. Uh, we are hiring. 
Uh, so this is a talk. Uh, it's called Metrics, Metrics Everywhere. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a talk about metrics at Yammer from, again, Coda Hill. Uh, and it talks about how uh, basically what we do is we turn code into business value. Uh, and how, how do we know what to make better? Um, so this happens on a number of levels at Yammer. Anything from user-triggered engagement events, measuring that, um, to measuring how our applications are actually performing. Um, and so the latter part of that is what we're going to talk about. So from this talk, there's this quote, if you don't measure it, you can't optimize it. Um, it's kind of one of the key takeaways. And so we think we know what's happening with the code we wrote, but we don't actually know unless we measure it. Um, and so at Yammer, one of the things we kind of know is that users like sites that are more performance. Like, that kind of seems like a no-brainer. Um, but what's it worth? How do we know how much to optimize? Things like that. Uh, how bad is bad? How good is good? Um, so we measured this. Uh, it probably sounds pretty crazy, but we ran a short experiment uh, where for a subset of our users, we added latency to their feeds, anywhere from 100 milliseconds to 500 milliseconds. Uh, and you'll probably never guess what happened. It's pretty obvious. We saw engagement drop. Less people wanted to use Yammer as we made their feeds slower. Um, so closer to 100 milliseconds didn't hurt us much. People were kind of forgiving. Uh, but as we got closer to 500 milliseconds, it causes users to engage less with Yammer or not come back at all. So that kind of gives us um, some reasons to, to focus on these things and to put like, code into business value. So now that we're measuring these things, we can start to make better business decisions about the things that we're going to be building. So cool, let's do this with our Rails apps as well. Um, so we have some, some timing stuff in our monolith, but when we, when we started to build smaller new Ruby services, um, we started leveraging active support notifications. Um, Rails tells you a bunch of shit that it's doing in your apps, uh, and you kind of just have to listen to it. Um, there's some other info that we can gather around garbage collection and other app-specific things, but this is a really good place to start. Um, when Rails processes an action, you get an event about that if you're listening for it. Uh, same thing with delivering an email message or querying the database or querying cache. Um, Rails is telling you about all these things, and we just have to subscribe to these events. And so it could be something as simple as this. Uh, we just sub here we're subscribing to the process action event. Uh, we get an event that has the controller in action in it. Um, and then there's some hand wavy stuff around reporter.timing. Uh, but for us, that's our StatsD uh, reporter. Um, and we're just telling it about uh, the total time taken, uh, the time we spent in the database, and the time we spent in the view. And so from here, we can aggregate all this stuff and report it up. Uh, for us, we run StatsD on each of our uh, different nodes for uh, Rails services. Uh, and then we calculate percentiles for each node. We calculate the P75, the 90, 95, and 99. Um, and then we report that somewhere so we can make dashboards and pretty graphs and things out of it. Um, for us, we use uh, Librato and New Relic, uh, depending on what we're looking at. Libra uh, New Relic does quite a bit for you, but it gets expensive quickly. Um, and Librato will take a little more work, uh, but you'll get better customization and the pricing is quite a bit different. And so there's tons of stuff that you can collect. Um, but it's really important that you figure out which metrics are important to your app, like what, it's, what, what you're gaining from it. Um, so this is an exam example dashboard. It's kind of hard to see, uh, but this is a dashboard for our email templating service called Maily. Um, and so obviously for a service like this, the thing that's important to us is that we're sending email, like different types of email. Um, so the things that we're going to look at is the number of emails going out, uh, how deep our postfix queue is, uh, things like that. Uh, obviously. Uh, making sure requests are going through is super important. Um, and since this service is hit asynchronously, response times aren't like super important, but we still want to keep things pretty snappy. So you can see there's a red line there kind of in the middle, and that's our P90, uh, P99 jumping around a little bit. But the P95 and everything else is right there around like 100 milliseconds. And so we rely on uh, these dashboards pretty heavily for when we deploy. Uh, having this open while we press the big deploy button gives us confidence that what we're pushing out uh, is working like it's supposed to. And we can see that. We can see messages still being delivered um, and that we're, we're delivering that business value. Uh, this is an instance where things aren't so good. We have a lot of peaks there. 
Um, but measuring helps us make this better. And so this graph is showing us every day at around 3 a.m., things get pretty slow, upwards of three seconds or so. Um, it turns out that's when we lo rotate logs on all of these machines. And so uh, since this mail templating service is using send mail and writing to disk a lot, uh, IO gets pretty contended. Um, so this is something we can look at and fix and make better. And so going to uh, like kind of the health check aspect, making sure things are healthy uh, is really important in our Rails apps as well. Uh, before we ship any services, we need to be able to track down when they're not performing properly, um, as well as being able to shut off access to troublesome nodes or nodes that are under maintenance. Um, so for most of our apps, this is a pretty simple middleware or a controller that checks a couple things and returns either a 200 or 500. Um, we're working on extracting some of this stuff out, so if you see a, a gem from Yammer in the future, this will be useful. Um, cool. And so some examples of things that you might want to health check against. If it's imperative that you query the database, that would be a good thing to, ha to check in your health check. Uh, same thing as pulling from cache, talking to an external service, uh, logging an event, uh, queuing a message. Any of these things, if you need them to serve traffic, you should be uh, health checking them. So this one gets discussed a lot in the Rails community, uh, especially since this made it into Rails 4.1 with the uh, security.yaml stuff, or sorry, secrets.yaml stuff. Uh, so keeping configuration out of your app code and keeping it organized. Um, so there's a, a convention that's kind of been developing in the community for quite some time, um, and Heroku pushes it pretty hard too, and that's around using environment variables. Um, we use a gem called Figaro that allows us to do this and allows both environment variables and like something similar to the drop wizard configuration with like an application.yaml file. Uh, so the concepts are the same, uh, but you've got a number of environments uh, that you're wa gonna want to deploy to, so uh, making sure you're able to switch around in these configs is pretty important. So this is something that in the drop wizard uh, that isn't specifically in Drop Wizard, uh, but it's a pattern that we implemented it in a lot of our Java services some time ago, um, and we've been bringing it back to our Rails apps. And so it's using circuit breakers to recover from failure. Uh, it's gotten pretty popular recently. Uh, Martin Fowler has a great post about it, so I'm only going to go over it uh, real briefly. Um, it would look something like this. You have your client that's querying your services. In the middle, you have a circuit breaker. Um, so here we make a request. Uh, the circuit breaker allows it to flow through. Uh, we get the response from the service. And then again, the client makes a request. Uh, circuit breaker allows it. We see that the response failed. So we kind of take note of that. Again, we make a request. This time, it times out. And again, times out. And so at this point, we know that there's something wrong, probably wrong with the service, and we should probably not keep uh, pounding it with traffic. Uh, so we've, at, at this last uh, request here, we're not hitting the service at all. The circuit breaker knows that the circuit is open and that it won't allow traffic through. And so at some point, we have to recover this, uh, but we're giving the service some time to recover since we know it's probably gonna fail. And so sweet, time for the last part here, uh, choosing the right stack to build on. This is the more controversial part. Um, and this is a huge struggle, especially uh, even for us. Um, do we build things in Ruby or Java? Uh, do we do it in Drop Wizard or Rails or Sinatra? Like how do we pick these things? Do we use something new like Golang or Rust? Um, like we always hear, use the best tool for the job, uh, but it's not this simple, so let's look at that. So what is the best tool? Figuring out what the best tool is depends on a number of things. Uh, is it the best tool for your company? Is it the best tool for your team in general? Is it the best tool for ops uh, at your company? Is it the best tool for the people who are responding to this thing? Uh, is it the best reason because of legacy reasons? So on, uh, the domain and the task. Um, and if all of this even evaluates to the, the best tool is something new, like what does that mean for production? And so we came up with some rough guidelines around what we think all production services should have. Uh, most of these things, 
we, we, we try and have most of these things, but some of them might be missing, but this is generally what we shoot for. We have to run, have a run book to know how to run this service, uh, how to respond to it in production. Like we said, health checks, pager duty alerts, uh, metrics, that it's logging and that we're rotating those logs. Uh, we're tracking exceptions, that it's easily deployable through our deployment system. Uh, we have a configuration repo with some of that different configuration. Uh, we have multiple nodes, so it's highly available. Uh, we're making backups. We have documents around disaster recovery. We know how to uh, handle uh, different processes. Uh, we implement circuit breakers. Like, there's a lot of things here that we have to cover. And so what this boils down to is that you need operational experience about all these different things. Like this, going into it day one, you don't know a lot of these things. You, you gain it over time. Um, and so it's not cheap. It's something that uh, you probably already have quite a bit of for a given language or framework, uh, but you build this up over time. And so introducing a new framework or language uh, means that some subset, if not all, of your team is going to have to learn this new thing or support it in production. Uh, so for us, we had the monolith uh, and a bunch of Ruby and Rails engineers um, to keep uh, building and maintaining that. But we've got these Java services too. So this doesn't really help us decide how to pick between the two. But it does lend us to continuing to build in Ruby with a little bit of overhead. Uh, so we've got quite a few tools and experiences that we've already built out from our monolith. Um, and as we build new services, we can kind of experiment and bring some of those changes back to the monolith as well. But even this only answers a couple questions from this slide here. Is it a good tool for the company? For us, probably. Uh, for the team, sure. Ops, yeah, they know how to deal with Ruby and Rails apps already. On-call, same thing. If it's a Rails app, uh, a lot of things are going to be similar. There will be some differences per app. Because of legacy reasons, that helps us. But these last two are still, is it the best thing for the domain or for this task in general? We probably need more information for that. And so like, we try and leverage the strengths of each of the stacks. Um, we all love Ruby. We think we know what it's good at. Uh, we know we have an amazing community. Uh, we like to think we focus on things like simplicity and expressiveness uh, and building things that are easy to change. Uh, so we've probably got uh, wildly differing views on other stacks, too. Um, a lot of us probably think about Java of of a long time ago with XML and complexities and kind of gobs of code. Uh, but the examples I showed weren't all that bad. Um, and you didn't see a single bit of XML there. Uh, but if you talk to Java developers who have seen like this monolith gone wild type thing, uh, Rails will really scare them. Uh, but we know it doesn't have to be that way either. Um, like we all know, Rails lets you get shit done pretty easily and quickly. And with a lot of these things we talked about, it lets you get to production fast too. Um, and hey, Ruby is getting faster too, like thanks to th tons of the work from the community. So right, ugh, this is really hard. Um, six months ago, this is where we were at. We were arguing at like which stack was better at business logic and like what you could iterate faster in. Um, and lots of things that we couldn't really necessarily define well. And so part of this, again, is just about picking a direction and going, uh, delivering business value. Like, that's the continuing theme here. Uh, so we've got some guidelines that at Yammer uh, we kind of use to decide uh, different stacks. Uh, and we can argue that these things are possible in both languages. Um, so these guidelines won't always be right. Uh, we won't always follow them, but it helps us like, kind of move forward. So quickly, because I think I'm out of time. <laughs> So at Yammer, uh, Ruby might be a better choice for us uh, when we need a faster frequent development iteration on something. Uh, when we're aggregating sequential sources or maybe a single source, uh, if we want to focus on expressiveness for business rules or use a DSL, like we don't really have a, a, an option for a DSL in Java. Um, or when we're going to perform tasks asynchronously, like Ruby is pretty good at handling that stuff out of band. Uh, but at Yammer, Java might be a better option when we need some of these other things. Uh, if it's in the critical performance path, if that's super important, we can't compromise, we might want to go with Java for that. Uh, if we need to truly parallelize things, um, whether it's tasks or gathering data, uh, if we need to support lots of concurrent connections, uh, Java will be a good choice for that. Um, and if we need to like keep large heaps, or uh, if we need a large heap to keep things in memory, uh, Java is going to be a pretty good choice for that. 
So real quickly, an example, uh, I talked about RD, our real-time service. Um, it allows clients to open connections so we can push out messages and such. It has a really stable API, uh, so it's not changing a whole lot. Um, it parallelizes message delivery to a lot of different connections. Uh, it's in the critical performance path, like it's a real-time service. People are expecting this thing to be real-time, and if, it's not, uh, if things aren't being done in real-time, uh, that's what makes Yammer feel especially slow. And then concurrent connections. Uh, at, the, at the time I was writing this, uh, already had 200,000 persistent connections to it. So that's a lot of, of connections at the same time for this thing to be able to handle. And so on the Ruby side, we have the service that we talked about called Melee. Um, it basically just receives uh, payloads of objects and parses that into email templates to be sent out through SendGrid. Um, and so we need to be able to uh, iterate on that frequently and, and, and often. Um, like I said, all the data comes up in, to us in a payload, so we're not worried about parallelization, per se. Uh, we're performing these things asynchronously, so um, it, we're not in the critical performance path. We can kind of cheat a little bit there. And then we need new templates to be added relatively easy, so because of Rails and some other conventions, we can do that. Um, we've got a great way to preview emails and test them. Um, it's kind of all there for us. And so quickly, uh, what about Ruby? Like we talked about Rails a lot um, through a lot of this, but what about Ruby? Like I switched, if you noticed a, a couple slides ago, I switched from talking about Rails to talking about just Ruby. Um, and so for us, many things that we've done, Rails has proven more beneficial than some of the other Rails, uh, Ruby alternatives. Uh, but we're not satisfied with that as an answer, just kind of the state of the world right now. Um, Last year, like I said, we pretty much had one or two Rails apps, and today we have five or six and more underway. Um, so that's a lot of progress. Um, as our team gets more comfortable with this, we'll continue to kind of get back out of our comfort zone uh, and experiment with more things. Uh, we fi might find that we still like Rails more, uh, or we might figure out a way to add some structure and convention to Sinatra in a way that we're not rebuilding Rails every time. So um, kind of who knows on this. So this is kind of the takeaway from that. Keep learning about these things. Uh, it shouldn't discourage us from experimenting. Maybe we picked the wrong tool. Maybe we fucked up our decision. Uh, we're kind of all adults, and we can acknowledge our mistakes. Uh, so we, we learn, we adjust, and we reevaluate. All right. I think I'm like five minutes over, so I apologize. But th three quick points that I want to uh, drive home here. Let's recap this. Uh, ops conventions are just as important as app conventions. Being able to put these things into production, know what they look like, and be able to do this repeatedly and quickly is super important. Uh, picking the best tool is really hard, but kind of get close, keep trying, keep evaluating. Um, and then finally, in the end, business goal is always the value. Uh, sorry, the end goal is always business value. Um, I talked about it a little bit, but I didn't mention it nearly enough. Like, this is why we're all here. This is why we're all programmers, like uh, delivering business value to customers. Um, so if we need to constantly be asking ourselves, does any of this help us move faster, uh, help us make more informed decisions? Uh, are we kind of reinventing the wheel? Is there something else we could use? Or is this really helping us provide better business value? And that's all I've got. Uh, my name's Brian. Uh, thanks for having me. Do we have time for questions, or do we need to move on? All right, questions. Hi, Alex. Hey, what's up? Uh, thanks for the talk, Brian. That was great. Um, I'm wondering, do you guys, um, your engineers, um, flop back and forth between Ruby and Java, or do you have like Java devs and Ruby devs? So we do have like a Rails team and a core services team that traditionally writes things in Java. Uh, but we don't really like that answer either. Like we, a lot of people will switch stacks. Not everyone does. Uh, but it's important that most of us are comfortable with that. So it's something we kind of strive to work on. Yes. Have you guys looked at using like JRuby as your stack at all to kind of leverage both worlds a little bit more directly as opposed to a binary either or? Yeah, kind of mixing JRuby and Drop Wizard gets kind of complicated. Uh, we've looked at JRuby for a number of things. For some stuff, like for the email service, MRI works pretty damn well. Um, 
And especially like with our monolith using JRuby, we leverage memcache pretty heavily. So having that C optimized gem there, like we do, what was it? Uh, millions of memcache gets per second. So like that performance would really hurt us if we didn't have that. Anyone else in the back there? Uh, how do you guys handle all that in development? So do you guys have like a Vagrant machine with Cockbox and install all that stack? Or every developer works like in those different pieces and just unit test that? Yeah, we have a Vagrant machine that we boot up. Um, it installs a small little app that we call Soup Kitchen. Um, and it, it allows you to install different services like from that panel. Um, so it uses our same deployment infrastructure that we use to go to production and to staging. Uh, but it packages it for uh, development environments instead. Hi. How do you guys do? Where am I looking? I'm awesome. <laughs> How do you guys do to share the business logic between the application in different languages? Yeah, that gets really hard. Like, I guess part of the idea is that you're, you don't want to share business logic. You want to create like, good abstractions so that we can just use HTTP to kind of talk everywhere. Um, but that's kind of a cop-out answer because you do need to share some sort of business logic. So sometimes it comes down to duplicating things. Uh, we don't have a great solution for that. Uh, we try and create as, as clear abstractions as we can and keep uh, like iterating on that. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks again, guys.